Join me in welcoming the Executive Director of the National Book Foundation, Harold Augenbrom. Each year, the National Book Awards judges select 10, the top 10 American authors in four categories, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and young people's literature. The top 10 authors are announced in September, five finalists in each category are named in October, and one winner in each category is selected in November during a ceremony in New York. Now in its 11th year, the NBA on Campus program connects the nation's most accomplished writers with students and scholars at select colleges and universities across the country. Each year, this program brings finalists to campus to conduct master classes and public readings and discussions of their work. This year, I am so proud that Rollins joins Amherst, Concordia, and Sam Houston University to become the fourth NBA on campus partner and the sole representative in the Southeast. Mr. Augenbrum has said, we want to reflect the National Book Awards is the nation's premier literary event and that's why we're partnering with schools like Rollins College that are strong in writing, literature, and the humanities. In many ways, Rollins is the perfect match for the NBA on campus program. The National Book Foundation, Founded, it, uh, founded in 1950, has as its mission to celebrate the best of American literature, to expand its audience, and to enhance the cultural value of great writing in America. These values are deeply shared by Rollins College, the Department of English, and in particular, by our Winter with the Writers program, directed by Professor Carol Frost, who herself is a former National Book Awards judge in the poetry category. Winter with the Writers is, as you know, a festival of literary arts that couples world-class writers with the college's creative environment, encouraging an appreciation of literary excellence in our American culture. So, tonight we are honored to have two National Book Award finalists join us in this inaugural event. Ross Gay, author of Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, finalist for the 2015 National Book Award in Poetry and Cy Montgomery, author of The Soul of an Octopus, finalist for the 2015 National Book Award for Nonfiction. To introduce our authors, it is my pleasure to introduce first Professor Carol Frost. She'll be coming in a moment. Um, Professor Frost, who holds the Theodore Bruce and Barbara Lawrence Alfon Chair of English, is the author of 12 books of poems. Her 2010 collection of poems, Honeycomb, was the recipient of the Gold Medal in Poetry from the Florida Book Awards. And in 2014, Tupelo Press published Entwined, three lyric sequences. Her poems have appeared in four Pushcart Prize anthologies, and she's been a recipient of two National Endowment of the Arts fellowships. Professor Frost has published poems in the Atlantic Monthly, American Poetry Review, Gettysburg Review, The Kenyon Review, and the New York Times, just to name a few. In addition, her essays on poetics have appeared in print, largely in the New England Review and on the web. In October 2008, her piece on Robert Frost, Sincerity and Inventions on Robert Frost, was posted on the Academy of American Poets website. In 2015, Rollins awarded Professor Frost the Bornstein Award for Faculty Scholarship, our highest honor, recognizing a Rollins faculty member whose outstanding scholarly achievement or creative accomplishment has helped bring national prominence to Rollins College. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the director of Winter of the Writers, Professor Carol Frost. Good evening. Wonderful to see you here. I wonder if you uh, all got the three by five cards that uh, were handed to you. Do, do, do you know why you have them? You have them because you have the opportunity, those of you who don't know, to write a, a question during the two readings, if you have one, because at the Q&A, they will be your questions that we will be asking the writers. So during the reading or, or readings or right afterwards, uh, please take one of our 
nifty went with the writer's pencils I think you were also handed and um, inscribe your question thank you Jenny Kavanaugh uh, thank you all for being here I have a couple of things I, I have to say one is that uh, we need to have your phones uh, shut off and then after the reading you can turn them right back on and uh, call everybody you know and tell them where you've been. Um, also, I, I need to say that there is no unauthorized photography nor uh, videotaping. We have, uh, we can thank our wonderful videotaper, Josh Chesarek. He's our first-rate official videographer. And you can, you'll be able to hear this again uh, if, you, if you wish. Uh, both on our website and also on the National Book Awards website. So welcome to the final reading of a series of four during the 2016 Winter with the Writers season and to the inaugural reading in partnership with the National Book Awards on campus program. Welcome students, distinguished guests, readers and writers. Tonight is, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome and introduce to you and to Rollins College campus, two notable writers, finalists for the 2015 National Book Awards. They are Ross Gay and Simon Montgomery. They'll read one after the other, having rolled dice in the green room <laughs> about who goes first and who goes last. And I'll tell you about them separately right before each reading. Cy Montgomery will read first, the Soul of an Octopus, a Surprising Exploration into the Wonder of Consciousness, was the first of 20 books on the list of National Book Award finalists that I read this November. And I was quickly enveloped in Cy Montgomery's marine world, the world of a surprisingly sentient octopus. To tell the truth, I found it rather difficult to put the book down. You know what that's like, reading more slowly, as you get to the end of a favorite book, savoring each, each passage, each sentence, not wanting the book to end. In Soul of an Octopus, Sai investigates the mysterious eight-legged creature uh, that in telling about her experience with three octopuses in aquariums, then telling us more after her research out into the wild. Her fascination in this book starts with interactions with aquarium octopuses, including Athena, Callie, and Octavia, all named, and ends with her time among wild octopuses in the open ocean, intimations of there being much, much more going on than instinct and reaction in the behavior of an octopus. Cy Montgomery has written many other books investigating the lives of creatures quite a lot like us, but also strange. Tigers in Spell of the Tiger, the man-eaters of Sun Sunbarans, dolphins in the Amazon in Journey of the Pink Dolphins, and the wild animals we see every day, birds, in Birdology. And I understand from Cy that she has just completed a book on eels. Cy Montgomery is a naturalist, documentary scriptwriter for National Geographic TV, and author of more than 20 acclaimed books of nonfiction for adults and children, including the memoir The Good Good Pig, The Extraordinary Life of Christopher Hogwood, which was a national bestseller. The recipient of numerous honors, including Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Humane Society and the New England Booksellers Association, she lives in New Hampshire with her husband, border collie, and flocks of chickens. Welcome, Simon Montgomery. Thanks. What a treat to be here. And I've got to say, I received the most lovely welcome when I came yesterday. And I just want to tell you, Rollins College, you're number one. <laughs> I'm going to read from the beginning of my book, The Soul of an Octopus. Chapter one is called Athena. On a rare, warm day in mid-March, 
when the snow was melting into mud in New Hampshire, I traveled to Boston, where everyone was strolling along the harbor or sitting on benches licking ice cream cones. But I quit the blessed sunlight for the moist, dim sanctuary of the New England Aquarium. I had a date with a giant Pacific octopus. I knew little about octopuses, not even that the scientifically correct plural is not octopi, as I'd always believed. It turns out you can't put a Latin ending, I, on a word derived from Greek, such as octopus. But what I did know intrigued me. Here is an animal with venom like a snake, a beak like a parrot, and ink like an old-fashioned pen. It can weigh as much as a man and stretch as long as a car, yet it can pour its baggy, boneless body through an opening the size of an orange. It can change color and shape. It can taste with its skin. Most fascinating of all, I had read that octopuses are smart. This bore out what scant experience I'd already had. Like many who visit public aquariums, I often had the feeling that the octopus I was watching was watching me back with an interest as keen as my own. How could that be? It's hard to find an animal more unlike a human than an octopus. Their bodies aren't organized like ours. We go head, body, limbs. They go body, head, limbs. Their mouths are in their armpits, or if you prefer to liken their arms to our lower instead of upper extremities between their legs. They breathe water. Their appendages are covered with dexterous, grasping suckers, a structure for which no mammal has an equivalent. And not only are octopuses on the opposite side of the great vertebral divide that separates the backboned creatures such as mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish from everyone else, they are classed within the invertebrates as mollusks, as are slugs and snails and clams, animals that are not particularly renowned for their intellect. Clams don't even have brains. More than half a billion years ago, the lineage that would lead to octopuses and the one leading to humans separated. Was it possible, I wondered, to reach another mind on the other side of that divide? Octopuses represent the great mystery of the other. They seem completely alien, and yet their world the ocean comprises far more of the Earth, 70% of its surface area, and more than 90% of its habitable space, than does land. Most land animals, I'm sorry, most animals on this planet live in the ocean, not on the land. And most of these animals are invertebrates. I wanted to meet the octopus. I wanted to touch an alternate reality. I wanted to explore a different kind of consciousness, if such a thing exists. What's it like to be an octopus? Is it anything like being a human? Is it even possible to know? So when the aquarium's director of public relations met me in the lobby and offered to introduce me to Athena, the octopus, I felt like a privileged visitor to another world. But what I began to discover that day was my own sweet blue planet, a world breathtakingly alien, startling, and wondrous, a place where, after half a century of life on this earth, much of it as a naturalist, I would at last feel fully at home. Athena's lead keeper isn't in. My heart sinks. Not just anyone can open up the octopus's tank, and for good reason. A giant Pacific octopus, the largest of the world's 250 or so octopus species, can easily overpower a person. Just one of a big male's three-inch diameter suckers can lift 30 pounds, and a giant Pacific octopus has 1,600 of them. An octopus bite 
can inject a neurotoxic venom as well as saliva that has the ability to dissolve flesh. And worst of all, an octopus can take the opportunity to escape from an open tank, and an escaped octopus is a big problem. <laughs> Happily, though, another Aquarius, Scott Dowd, will help me. A big guy in his early 40s with a silvery beard and twinkling blue eyes, Scott is the senior Aquarius for the Freshwater Gallery, which is down the hall from Cold Marine, where Athena lives. Scott first came to the aquarium as a baby in diapers on its opening day, June 20th, 1969, and basically he never left. He knows every animal in the aquarium personally. Athena is about two and a half years old and weighs roughly 40 pounds, Scott explains as he lifts the heavy lid covering her tank. I mount the three short steps of a small movable stair and lean over to see. She stretches about five feet long. Her head, and by head, I really mean both the actual head and the mantle or body, because that's where we expect an animal's head to be, is about the size of a small watermelon, or at least a honeydew, says Scott. When she first came, it was the size of a grapefruit. The giant Pacific octopus is one of the fastest growing animals on the planet. Hatching from an egg the size of a grain of rice, one can grow both longer and heavier than a person in three years. By the time Scott has propped open the tank cover, Athena has already oozed from the far corner of her 560-gallon tank to investigate us. Holding to the corner with her two arms, she unfurls the others, her whole body red with excitement, and reaches to the surface. Her white suckers face up like the palm of a person reaching out for a handshake. May I touch her? I ask Scott. Sure, he says. I take off my wristwatch, remove my scarf, roll up my sleeves, and plunge both arms elbow deep into the shockingly cold 47 degree Fahrenheit water. Twisting, gelatinous. Her arms boil up from the water, reaching for mine. Instantly, both my hands and forearms are engulfed by dozens of soft, questing suckers. Not everyone would like this. <laughs> the naturalist and explorer William Beebe found the touch of the octopus repulsive. I've always a struggle before I can make my hands do their duty and seize a tentacle, he confessed. Victor Hugo imagined such an event as an unmitigated horror leading to certain doom. The specter lies upon you. The tiger can only devour you, but the devilfish, horrible, sucks your lifeblood away, Hugo wrote in Toilers of the Sea. No animal is more savage in causing the death of man in the water, Pliny the Elder wrote in Naturis Historia, circa A.D. 79, for it struggles with him by coiling round him and it swallows him with sucker cups and drags him asunder. But Athena's suction is gentle, though insistent. It pulls me like an alien's kiss. Her melon-sized head bobs to the surface, and her left eye, octopuses have a dominant eye as people have dominant hands, swivels in its socket to meet mine. Her black pupil is a fat hyphen in a pearly globe. Its expression reminds me of the look in the eyes of paintings of Hindu gods and goddesses, serene, all-knowing, heavy with wisdom, stretching back beyond time. She's looking right at you, Scott says. As I hold her glittering gaze, I instinctively reach to touch her head. As supple as leather, as tough as steel, as cold as night, Hugo wrote of the octopus's flesh. But to my surprise, her head is silky and softer than custard. Her skin is flecked with ruby and silver, a night sky reflected on the wine-dark sea. As I stroke her with my fingertips, her skin goes white beneath my touch. 
White is the color of a relaxed octopus. In cuttlefish, close relatives of octopus, females turn white when they encounter a fellow female, someone who they need not fight or flee. It's possible, in fact, that Athena knows I'm female. Female octopuses, like female humans, possess estrogen. She could be tasting and recognizing mine. Octopuses can taste with their entire bodies, but the sense is most exquisitely developed in the suckers. Athena's is an exceptionally intimate embrace. She is at once tasting and touching my skin, and possibly the muscle, bone, and blood beneath. Even though we've just met, Athena already knows me in a way no being has known me before. And she seems as curious about me as I am about her. Slowly, she transfers her grip on me from the outer suckers at the tips of her arms to the stronger, larger ones nearer her head. I'm now bent at a 90-degree angle, folded like a half-open book as I stand on the little step stool, and I realize what's happening. She's pulling me steadily into her tank. How happily I'd go with her. But alas, I wouldn't fit. Her lair is beneath a rocky overhang into which she can flow like water, but I cannot, constrained as I am by bones and joints. The water in her tank would come to chest height on me if I were standing up, but the way she's pulling me, I would be upside down, head first in the water, and soon facing the limitations of my air-hungry lungs. I ask Scott if I should try to detach from her grip, and he gently pulls us apart, her suckers making popping sounds like small plungers as my skin is released. Thank you so much. What a wonderful reading. Um, I've heard part of this before, and of course I've loved the book. Um, and if you don't all have it, you should buy seven copies to give to... Uh, right. Um, oh, that's right, eight copies. Uh, nine copies. Give eight away to your best friends and uh, keep one for yourself. We could keep on. Let's see, you'll keep uh, eight for yourself. and. Uh, um, but, but, but now I'd like also to introduce you to Ross Gay. Uh, we've had a reading that includes much poetry, although I know that, uh, that, that you, Sai, would, um, would say that you know nothing about poetry. But such beautiful sentences, su su such beautiful images. We're pleased to have Ross Gay here at Rollins College this evening as a Winter with the Writers guest. I can tell you that winter with the writer's interns, 13 fortunate undergraduates, have been ultra excited. One of the perks of being an intern during our yearly festival is walking with an author from hotel to master class, meet and greet to lunch, and so on. It's an opportunity to talk a little bit about verse or humanity with the sun hopefully shining or the rain light. Ross could be Pied Piper. He has so many followers. And after this reading, if you don't already know why this is so, you will hear it in his cadences, his joyful noise, his sensual lines, his hot, hotfulness that includes both darkness and grace. As if in the dream of light, Gerald Stern said of his first book, he cannot allow himself to forget the darkness. He is so given over to the honest and accurate rendering. Yes, you will hear every reason to go along with him wherever he leads. Roske is the author of three books of poems, Against Which, Bringing the Shovel Down, and his latest collection, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, which was a 2015 National Book Awards finalist. He is also the co-author with Amy uh, Nezuku Mahahil, of the chapbook Lace and Pyrite, Letters from Two Gardens, in addition to being co-author 
with Richard Werenberg Jr. of the Chapbook River. He is the founding editor with Carissa Chen and Patrick Rosso of the online sports magazine, some call it Ballin, in addition to being an editor with the Chapbook Press's Q Avenue and Ledge Mule Press. Ross is a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, a nonprofit free fruit for all, uh, free fruit for all food, justice, and joy project. He has received fellowships from Cave Canem, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Guggenheim Foundation. Ross teaches at Indiana University. Best of all, Ross Gay is in the auditorium. Put your hands together, wolf whistle if you like, to welcome this extraordinary poet to the stage, Ross Gay. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks, fun to read with you. I love, love that. These are loquats. Someone was kind enough. What's your name? Who brought these? Mary. Mary. That was so kind of you. My God. A loquat does not grow in Indiana, nor does it grow in Boston, where I'm living right now. So this is an incredible <laughs> gift. God, they're a little underripe, but they're delicious still. So, thank you. It's really fun to be here. It's fun to be here with you. Thank you. I'm going to read a poem um, from Mary. Um, because there's nothing... I mean, there's a lot of nice things you can do for someone. But giving someone fruit, like picking it <laughs> for someone, God, at their church, it's like, this is so nice. Everything about it's nice. This is called To the Mulberry Tree. How many of you have eaten mulberries off the tree? Okay, a lot of people. None of you students have. What are you studying? <laughs> <laughs> to the mulberry tree. Everyone knows it's good luck if inconvenient when a bird shits on you. But even more so, good luck if the bird shits on you when you're plucking gold currant tomatoes sweet enough to make your bare feet lift just so off the ground and the beetles beneath scurry and giggle. And as I move to gobble one, mouth agape and swooped in a grin at once, the shit slurries half in and half on my sun-warmed chin, which, forgive me, jiggles me from my reverie, for I am only human, swiping the slurp of turd from my mouth, only to see it is mostly purple, the goop seedy and gelatinous. And when I see the bird pitching its swill from the branch above, I know that, yes, this shit is mostly berry from that most prolific of trees, which some numbskulls call a weed because it's so prolific and not, they say, particularly useful. These same some call insipid the mulberry's flavor which I think means tasteless or bland, but given I detect swirled in the shit the sweet of the thing, insipid doesn't fit the bill, but rather most likely describes the sex life of the describer. <laughs> but why should I get personal defending a tree's honor? Mostly I'm happy the birds feast on the topmost branches of these tall trees and leave be for the time being my blueberries and soon blackberries and grapes and these little tomatoes. Though to be sure, it is a certain glee as spring gasps into summer and the lowest branches shimmer with their simple booty, which I must jump for and sometimes high, which I will not probably always be able to do. For jumping and grabbing at once like this, a soft thing is hard. Be gentle, she said emerging from the dugout beneath the mulberry tree, where the big kids gathered, and we mostly rode our bikes by fast, so as not to be snatched to the ground and pummeled, or worse, for they were teenagers. But I knew this early July morning, there would be nowhere to be found, and the tree would be burdened with a crop begging to be loosed on my ice cream. She wiped her eyes and yawned and put on glasses, and there was in her hair a little sprig of grass. And she was barefoot, laughing and filling with me slowly my bucket, eating a few when it was full, giggling at the small burst of juice one made on her chin. And behind her, beneath the tree, 
There was a filthy blanket and a pack of cigarettes and tinfoil wrappers crumpled and shimmering and the frayed remnants of a rope. And seeing me seeing into the terrible future, she put softly one hand on my chin and the other in my hair, turning my head away from what wreckage waited in there and back into the leaves, which too I will do to you so that none of us will ever die terribly, but stay always like this, lips and fingers blushed purple, the faint sugar ghosting our mouths beneath the tree inside me, which is now the same tree grown inside you. All of us snugged in the canopy on our tippy toes, gathering fruit for good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has that happened to anyone? A bird shit in their mouth? Um, um, is Grace in the audience? All right. I'm going to read. Was that yes or was that? Yes. Okay, I'm going to read a poem for you. This is called Ode to the Puritan in Me. There is a Puritan in me, the brim of whose hat is so sharp it could cut your tongue out. With a brow so furrowed, you could plant beets or turnips or something, of course, good for storing. He has not taken a nap since he was two years old because he detests sloth above all. He is maybe the only real person I've ever heard say sloth or detest in conversation. He reads poetry, the Puritan in me, with an exacto knife in his calloused hand, if not a stick of dynamite. And if the Puritan in me sees two cats making whoopee in the barn, I think not because they get in the way or scare the cows, but more precisely because he thinks it is worthless, the angles of animals fucking freely in the open air, he will blast them to smithereens. I should tell you, the Puritan in me always carries a shotgun. He wants to punish the world, I suppose, because he feels he needs punishing for who knows how many unpunishable things. Like the times as a boy he'd sneak shirtless between the cows to haul his tongue across the salt lick, or how he'd study his dozing granny's instep like it was the map of his county, or the spring nights he'd sneak to the garden behind the sleeping house and strip naked while upon him lathered the small song of the ants rasping their tongues across the peony's sap, making of his body a flower-dappled tree, while above him the heavens wheeled and his tongue drowsed slack as a creek, on the banks of which, there he is, right now, the Puritan in me, tossing his shotgun into the cattails, taking off his boots and washing his feet in that water. Okay, I'm going to read um, two more poems. One of them's kind of long, so um, three short poems and shorter poems and one longish one. Um, this one is called Ode to Sleeping in My Clothes, which I like to do time to time. I don't have a problem. And though I don't mention it to my mother or the doctors with their white coats, it is, in fact, a great source of happiness for me. As I don't even remove my socks and will sometimes even pull up my hood and slide my hands deep in my pockets and probably more so than usual look as if something bad has happened. My heart blasting a last somersault or some artery parting like curtains in a theater while the cavalry of blood comes charging through, except unlike so many of the dead, I must be smiling there in my denim and cotton sarcophagus, slightly rank from the day. It is said that Shostakovich slept with a packed suitcase beneath his bed, and it is said that black people were snatched from dark streets and made experiments of... And you and I both have family whose life savings are tucked 12 feet beneath the Norway maple whose roots splay like the bones in the foot of a man who has walked to Youngstown, Ohio from Arkansas without sleeping or keeping his name. And it's a miracle 
maybe I almost never think of, to rise like this and simply by sliding my feet into my boots while the water for coffee gathers its song, be in the garden or on the stoop, running almost from nothing. And this last poem I'm going to read you is called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. It's a little bit long. I should tell you, I have to pee. <laughs> I was thinking that right toward the end of Sai's reading, I was like, uh-oh. I have to pee. So um, that's just like a drama, extra drama that you get to witness. Um, there's two things that you should know. Like Carol talked about in the introduction, I work with this thing called the Bloomington Community Orchard. And that's a, it's a public orchard. It's something that a woman named Amy Countryman sort of proposed as an undergraduate thesis project. Um, it was a beautiful project. Her advisor recommended she take it to the urban forester. Um, the urban forester said, well, if you can get enough support, we'll let you use an acre of land and give you a little bit of seed money. <clears throat> so sure enough, she had a call out, and there were about, I don't know, 150, 200 people at the call out. Um, and we, as a group, um, made this orchard, which entailed tons of difficult, lovely, beautiful, sloppy, um, uh, heartfelt work. It was, it's some of the most important work and beautiful work I've done uh, in my life. So there's an orchard in Bloomington. I want you to go to it. Um, the other thing is that I mentioned this person, this thing named Era Lee. Uh, that used to be a thing. Now that's a person and she's like three years old. Catalog of unabashed gratitude. Uh, so I'm talking about the orchard in this a bit. Catalog of unabashed gratitude. Friends, will you bear with me today? For I have awakened from a dream in which a robin made with its shabby wings a kind of veil, behind which it shimmied and stomped something from the south of Spain, its breast a flare looking me dead in the eye from the branch that grew into my window, coochie-cooing my chin, the bird shuff shuffling its little talons left, then right, while the leaves bristled against the plaster wall, two of them drifting onto my blanket, while the bird opened and closed its wings like a bird giving up on murder, jutting its beak, turning a circle and flashing again the ruddy bombast of its breast, by which I knew upon waking it was telling me in no uncertain terms to bellow forth the tubas and sousaphones, the whole rusty brass band of gratitude not quite dormant in my belly. It said so in a human voice, bellow forth. <laughs> and who among us could ignore such odd and precise counsel? Hear ye, hear ye, I am here to holler that I have hauled tons, by which I don't mean lots, I mean tons of cow shit and stood ankle deep in swales of maggots swirling the spent beer grains the brewery man was good enough to dump off holding his nose for they smell very bad to make the compost writhe giddy and lick its lips twirling dung with my pitchfork again and again with hundreds and hundreds of other people we dreamt an orchard this way furrowing our brows and hauling our wheelbarrows and sweating through our shirts and less than a year later there was a party at which trees were sunk into the well-fed earth one of which a liberty apple after being watered in was tamped by a baby barefoot with a bow in her hair biting her lip and her joyous work and friends this is the realest place I know it makes me squirm like a worm I'm so grateful you could ride your bike there or roller skate or catch the bus there's a fence and a gate twisted by hand there was a fig tree taller than you in Indiana it will make you gasp and might make you want to stay alive even thank you and thank you for not taking the pa my pal when the engine of his mind dragged him to swig fistfuls of Xanax and a bottle or two of booze. And thank you for taking my father a few years after his own father went down. Thank you, Mercy. Mercy, thank you for not smoking meth with your mother. Thank you for leaving 
and for coming back. And thank you for what inside my friend's love bursts like a throng of roadside goldenrod gleaming into the world, likely hauling a shovel with her like one named Era Lee Ott, with hands big as a horse's, and who, like one named Era Lee Ott, will laugh time to time till the juice runs from her nose. Oh, thank you for the way a small thing's wail makes the milk or what once was milk in us gather into horses huckle buckling across a field. And thank you, friends, when last spring the hyacinth bells rang and the crocuses flaunted their upturned skirts and a quiet roved the beehive which when I entered were snugged two or three dead fist-sized clutches of bees between the frames, almost clinging to one another. This one's tiny head pushed into another's tiny wing one's forelegs resting on another's face, the translucent paper of their wings fluttering beneath my breath, and when a few dropped to the frames beneath, honey, and after falling down to cry, everything's glacial shine. And thank you to, I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> No, hang on. We got time. I know. Huh? Put your seatbelt on. And thank you. <laughs> and thank you, too. And thanks for the corduroy couch I have put you on. Put your feet up. Here's a light blanket, a pillow, dear one, for this is going to be long. <laughs> I can't stop my gratitude, which includes, dear reader, you, for staying here with me, for moving your lips just so as I speak. Here's a cup of tea. I've spooned honey into it. And thank you, the tiny bee shadow perusing these words as I write them. And the way my love talks quietly when in the hive. So quietly, in fact, you cannot hear her, but only notice barely her lips moving in conversation. Thank you, what does not scare her in me, but makes her reach my way. Thank you, the love she is, which hurts sometimes. And the time she misremembered elephants in one of my poems, which, oh, here they come. Garlanded with morning glory and wisteria blooms, trombones all the way down to the river. Thank you, the quiet in which the river bends around the elephant's solemn trunk, polishing stones, floating on its gentle back, the flock of geese flying overhead. And to the quick and gentle flocking of men to the old lady falling down on the corner of Fairmount and 18th, holding patiently with the softest parts of their hands her cane and purple cat, gathering for her the contents of her purse and touching her shoulder and elbow. And thank you to the cockeyed court on which in a half court three on three, we old heads made of some runny nosed kids a shambles. And the 61-year-old, after flipping a reverse layup off a backdoor cut from my no-look pass to seal the game, ripped off his shirt and threw punches at the gods and hollered at the kids to admire the pacemaker's scar grinning across his chest. Thank you, the glad accordions wheeze in the chest. Thank you, the bagpipes. Thank you to the woman barefoot in a gaudy dress for stopping her car in the middle of the road and the tractor trailer behind her and the van behind it whisking a turtle off the road. Thank you, God of gaudy. Thank you, Paisley panties. Thank you, the organ up my dress. Thank you, the sheer dress you wore kneeling in my dream at the creek's edge and the light swimming through it. The coy kissing halos into the glassy air. The room in my mind with the blinds drawn where we nearly injure each other, crawling into the shawl of the other's body. And thank you when I say it plain, fuck each other dumb. And you all, again, you for the true kindness it has been for you to remain awake with me like this, nodding time to time and making that noise, which I take to mean yes, or I understand, or please go on, but not too long, <laughs> or why are you spitting so much, or easy, tiger, hands to yourself. I'm excitable. I'm sorry. I'm grateful. I just want us to be friends now forever. Take this bowl of blackberries from the garden. The sun has made them warm. I picked them just for you. I promise 
I will try to stay on my side of the couch. And thank you, the baggie of dreadlocks I found in a drawer while washing and folding the clothes of our murdered friend. The photo in which his arm slung around the sign to the trail of silences. Thank you, the way before he died, he held his hands open to us for coming back in a waft of incense or in the shape of a boy in another city looking from between his mother's legs or disappearing into the stacks after brushing by. For moseying back in dreams where, seeing us lost and scared, he put his hand on our shoulders and pointed us to the temple across town. And thank you to the man all night long hosing a mist on his early bloomed peach tree so that the hard frost not waste the crop. The ice in his beard and the ghosts lifting from him when the warming sun told him, sleep now. Thank you, the ancestor who loved you before she knew you by smuggling seeds into her braid for the long journey who loved you before he knew you by putting a walnut tree in the ground, who loved you before she knew you by not slaughtering the land. Thank you, who did not bulldoze the ancient grove of dates and olives, who sailed his keys into the ocean and walked softly home, who did not fire, who did not plunge the head into the toilet, who said, stop, don't do that, who lifted some broken someone up, who volunteered the way a plant birthed of the reseeding plant is called a volunteer, like the plum tree that marched beside the raised bed in my garden, like the arugula that marched itself between the blueberries, nary a bayonet, nary an army, nary a nation, which usage of the word volunteer, familiar to gardeners the wide world said, made my pal shout, oh, and dance and punch his knuckles into the lush soil before gobbling two strawberries and digging a song from his guitar made of wood from a tree someone planted. Thank you. Thank you, Zinnia and Gooseberry, Rebecca and Paw Paw, Ashmead's Colonel, Cox comb and scarlet runner, fever few and lemon balm. Thank you, knit bone and sweet grass and sun choke and false indigo whose petals stammered apart by bumblebees. Good Lord, give me a minute. And moon glow and catkin and crook neck and painted tongue and seed pot and Johnny jump up. Thank you what in us rackets glad, what glad rackets us. And thank you to this knuckle-headed heart, this pelican heart, this gap-toothed heart flinging open its gaudy maw to the sky. Oh, clumsy. Oh, bumble-fucked. Oh, giddy. Oh, dumbstruck. Oh, rickshaw. Oh, goat twisting its head at me from my peach tree's highest branch, balanced and possibly gobbling the last fruit, its tongue working like an engine, a lone sweet drop tumbling by some miracle into my mouth like the smell of someone I've loved, heart like an elephant screaming at the bones of its dead, heart like the lady on the bus dressed head to toe in gold, the sun shivering her shiny boots, singing Erica Badu to herself, leaning her head against the window, and thank you the way my father one time came back in a dream by plucking the two cables beneath my chin like a bass fiddle strings and played me until I woke singing. No kidding. I was singing and smiling. Thank you. Thank you. Stumbling in the garden where the Juneberry flowers had burst open like the bells of French horns. The lily my mother and I planted oozed into the air. The Brazilian ants labored in their earthen workshops below. The collard greens waved in the wind like the sails of ships. And the wasps swam in the mint bloom's viscous swill. And you, again you, dear friend, for hanging tight. I know I can be long-winded sometimes. I just want to rub the sponge of gratitude over every single thing, including you, which, yes, is awkward. The little crystals of soap going down your shirt there. Soon it will be over, which is precisely what the child in my dream said holding my hand, pointing at the roiling sea and the sky, hurtling our way like so many buffalo who said, it's much worse than we think. And sooner, to whom I said, no duh, child, in my dreams. What do you think this singing and shuddering is? What this screaming and reaching and dancing and crying is other than loving what every second goes away? Goodbye, I mean to say. And thank you. Every day. 
Thank you. I'm just on the, uh, the lady, right?
Capo. Yeah, you're gonna. Yep, it's on. Yep. Again, you two. Wow, what what a wonderful reading uh, from you, Sai, and from you, Ross. Uh, God, you're and, awesome. uh, I heard you read at the National Book Awards, and I've heard you before, Ross, because we've taught together, and uh, I just love hearing you again. Mm. Uh, and that actually leads me to the third question here, as I remember it. Do you prefer reading out loud? Do you prefer, um, I think, reading? in silence or to yourself. I'm not sure, you could, the second one could be being read in silence, meaning mm. from the reader's perspective, mm. or being read out loud by the reader's perspective. Mm. And also, uh, and this is for you too, Sai. Um, <laughs> uh, so, wake up. <laughs> um, so, um, so answer that question, uh, either of you, any way you'd like. Sometimes when you're reading something, you're alarmed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my God, what am I now? And it, it, it sounds totally different uh, um, when you read it out loud than it does in your head sometimes. Uh -huh. And um, I do some writing for radio, and I've done some uh, writing for TV, and it's different when you're writing for the voice versus the, mm. the ear frequently. So you, do you hear the audience differently then, do you think? Or are you more aware, or are you aware of the audience in a different way, hmm. is what I'm, I guess what I'm asking. You know, when you're here in front of a, a live audience or when you're writing for uh, television? Well, when you're writing for television, it's extremely stressful and you're probably growing a big stress zit the whole time. <laughs> um, I've, I've only done it a couple of times for National Geographic TV and uh, it's, it's, just, it's just really, really stressful because the, you're sitting there with an avid editor and they're saying, we need a burst of sound of 30 seconds right here. Bam, right there. And you've got to write it and it's like the worst deadline mm. stuff you ever did. Um, but for radio, and, uh, for example, you know, you're, you're writing shorter sentences, you're writing for the for the, for the voice, not the brain. And when I did the audio for this book, which I read myself, I was often surprised that some of these sentences were very, very long. Mm. But, they, they, but they, they were fine when you're mm. writing them and when you're reading them in your head, but then you're, you're reading them out of your mouth and your tongue is growing tired or your mm. lips are wanting to lie down. And, mm. you know, <laughs> It's different. I don't know. How about for poetry? Well, I definitely read, I, I write poems with the, I'm thinking that they're going to be both on a page and all in the air, like no doubt about it. Um, mm -hmm. So I will revise sometimes because I can't say a thing. Um, like I can't say a thing well enough, quickly enough in the way that I'm going to read it. So that, that's part of my precision, my uh, revision process. Um, so my body is totally involved in my composition process. And then you did ask another thing though, like about imagining a reader, like right. how you're, mm -hmm. and when you said that, like that, 
and this is really self-involved, um, but nothing, I mean, there's, I have many pleasures receiving loquats. That's one of the great pleasures of the world. Um, but it's also a, a delight to hear someone else read your poem to you. For me, I love that. It's like sexy, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's because, you know, it's like your body is going into someone else's body. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah. And that is, to me, it's, <laughs> that's really fun. Yeah. Um, so I'm acutely aware of how these things operate in the air. Like, it matters to me, you know? It really matters. Right. So the Pied Piper, <laughs> taking the children out of the village uh, who are all reading your poems or mm -hmm. his poems to him. Mm -hmm. All right, that's too long. I'll change the question. <laughs> yeah. um, how does, uh, I think this is a wonderful question. How does wonder play a part in your process mm -hmm. and uh, your inspiration? Mm. What does sheer wonder? Mm. I'll start. Um, and uh, one, uh, one of the things that I said to Cy when we first got here is that it feels like a fun match uh, because we're both sort of like wonderstruck by, that's sort of our, uh, our mode in some way, um, mm -hmm. to be sort of blown away by the earth or various things. Um, I don't know. I mean, just like sort of uh, the sort of fundamental premise of my poetry thing is like, questions, and I said this in the class today, like questions are what I am uh, intrigued by, questions, I'm intrigued by, you know, questions make me want to write poems, questions actually make me want to be alive, you know, questions make me interested in other people and other people's poetry. Um, so, and that is to me very much connected to wonder. A state of wonder is also a state of like, how is this possible, or what is this thing? And I'm not particularly interested at always finding out what is this thing actually? I'm often interested in being like, wow, this is a wonderful thing, you know? So, yeah. And Sai? Yeah, well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I feel that very much in your poetry, mm -hmm. that you are just gobsmacked mm -hmm. by this world. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I, I feel that way too. Mm -hmm. And um, every, every book I've ever written is a falling in love, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, Every, every time you do this, you're just opening yourself up for mm -hmm. something entirely new and letting it gobble you up mm -hmm. and fill you up mm -hmm. and astonish you over and over and over. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is one reason why it's easy for me to write for kids. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they, they haven't... They can do that. Yeah, and, yeah. and trying to get that beginner's mind, yeah. I always feel that beginner's yeah. mind because I'm always ast astonished. Right by the way things work if you just pay attention. Mm -hmm. And boy, in the sea, it's really like that. We were talking about your, your poem about the sea hair. Right. I mean, but there's so much stuff in the world that you <laughs> never would have come up with, okay. you know? And, and you're just like, look at that. <laughs> We've yeah. been spending our time on Google uh, looking up creatures <laughs> and trying to figure out, <laughs> is this a cooter? <laughs> turtle, or is this a uh, gopher turtle? Uh, yeah. I thought it was a gopher turtle. It turned out to be a cooter in, in our back. Um, or, oh, no, tortoise, sorry. A gopher tortoise mm. or a cooter turtle. And we decided it was a, 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 a turtle, right? A yes. cooter, yeah. And then sea hares, and what else were we looking up? Uh, a couple of other things. Um, some of the students. Corey, what were, you, what were you showing us? Oh, the turtle, I guess, right? Oh yeah! Oh my goodness! Right. And it, but it doesn't have to be. Right? <laughs> but it doesn't have to be something extraordinary. Just the ordinary is uh, full of wonder for yeah. for writers. Yeah. Oftentimes, yeah. don't you think? Yeah, that's yeah. like the practice, like yeah. training that, like gobsmacked. You know, de cultivating a sense of gobsmackedness. <laughs> yeah, that's like that's. I think that's good practice. You know, not being uh, what you, like not being nonchalant. Not being like, oh yeah, I've seen that, I know that, but actually like um, puzzled and flummoxed yes. and delighted by it, you yeah. know, and curious, curiosity. And yeah. just forever surprised yeah. Yeah. and delighted. Right. I mean, even, even things that seem horrifying yeah. can be kind of delightful in an mm -hmm. odd, mm -hmm. odd way. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, look at this world, mm -hmm. it's un unimaginable, mm -hmm. and yet there mm -hmm. it is, and you're right. part of it. Right, 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 yeah. 
Okay, so this question, Ross, is for you. Tell us about exotic fruit you have eaten. Exotic <laughs> fruit? Um, loquats, I guess. Uh, <laughs> just this night. What are, you know, my dad, I made a bunch of different kind of fruits. Uh, pawpaw, do you all know the pawpaw? Sure. An American fruit. Um, what else? American persimmon, that's a fruit that a lot of people have not eaten. How many of you eaten American persimmons? That's a good fruit. That's a really good fruit. Yeah, if it's not right, that's a really bad fruit. That's a really bad fruit. Um, my dad was a sweet man, and he would, even like we, we barely could talk for a bunch of years, but he would always, like if he had a chance, I don't know if he went by a market or something, he'd find like a fruit that he thought I had never had before, and he'd give it to me, you know, um, and he'd bring it home. And, and, you know, like we could barely talk, but I kind of imagine him like looking from afar, like me eating the fruit and usually being pretty excited by it and not being able to say thanks, Dad, really. Um, but him seeing me being delighted in a really sweet Have experience. you had the, the May apple? That's a northeastern fruit. I haven't eaten that, yeah. No. I have not eaten that. Delicious. Is it? Yeah, if you visit us in New York okay, at yeah. the right season. Okay, okay? yeah. It's a little yeah. bit that, what we were talking about before, kind of a combination between a lemon and a strawberry. Oh, it is? So it's tart, oh, wow. and you make, wonderful, you make wonderful jelly out of it. Wow. Yeah. You should all visit us up north. <laughs> for Sai, are there any animals you would never want to, for lack of a better word, touch? Hmm. Well, I wasn't thrilled about leeches, you know, <laughs> but, but they touched me plenty. <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, and certain kinds of stinging ants. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. The social insects could be a problem. <laughs> Ross, how do you challenge yourself to write outside of conventions? Have you ever experienced any criticisms of your perverse poems that made you question ex <laughs> I think I'm going to stick to the first part. <laughs> no, 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 I want to hear the second part. That's the second part is better. Oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is, have you ever experienced any criticism of your more perverse poems that made you question experimentation? <laughs> what kind of experimentation? What are you talking about? Um, that is so funny. Um, you know, I'll say this. There was a guy who reviewed a book of mine, and <laughs> this is really funny. This guy, poor guy, he, he wrote a review about a book of mine, and he said this thing. <laughs> I have this poem in the second book, and it's a sweet poem, and it's, I don't know, it's called like, I don't know, it's got a bad title, I don't know what it's called. Um, <laughs> but it's just like a love, lust poem, and uh, at some point, there's this line that I love, it says, your, your teeth hurt wanting to fuck, you know? And there's this other line in there that says something like, you know, two people are like hanging out in a park, and all the flowers shimmering in the labia are like quivering near you, you know? I know, it's over the top. Um, and this, and this, this guy, he said, now I don't quite know the reference, but you all, some of you will know this reference. He said, the book's okay, but if I had that tool from Men in Black that you could hold up and it makes your whole movie go up, I would, after that line, I would have put that on my face or something like that. So I guess, yes, I have gotten some criticism from my part. <laughs> Yeah. The other question, how do you challenge yourself to write outside of conventions? Um, um, that's a good question. I don't know. I like to use, write in different forms. Um, I, some of the poets who I really admire write uh, sort of strange, hard to characterize uh, um, work, work that moves in and out of sort of form. Um, so <clears throat> I read and admire the work that does that. So that's a way that I challenge myself to do it. Um, um, yeah. But see, I told you, that's way less interesting than the perversity question. <laughs> yeah. Sai, what animals through your life, uh, what animals through your life have you had the deepest bond? Well, my, my first erotic love when I was seven was a parakeet. He was the first mm -hmm. to make love to me. And it began when he threw up on my finger which I understood at the time to be a loving gesture. And we were talking about this earlier today. 
you know, a person throws up on you, and you know, it's not such a turn on. But um, <laughs> when a bird does that, they're feeding you. And they're, they're saying, I love you enough to give you my food that has already even been in my body, you know? And this is for you. And um, dogs sometimes do that too, as wolves, as wolves do for their young. Um, and uh, Jerry, who was a green parakeet, also actually, you know, people are going to think that birds are constantly copulating with me. But... <laughs> Because earlier today I was showing a, a picture of a giant endangered nocturnal parrot mating with my head. But um, Jerry was mating <laughs> Jerry was mating with my hand when I was I was seven. And um, I, I kinda knew what was going on, but kinda didn't. I mean I didn't know what went on with people, but I, I knew that this was something very, very serious. So Jerry was really important to me. And um, the closest thing I had to a sibling was a Scottish Terrier named Molly, who we were pups together. Mm. And I was very aware growing up that she was finished and complete before I was, that she was an adult before I was. And I used to, I never dressed her in baby clothes or anything like that. I always imagined, I, I had this fantasy of living in the woods with Molly and she would teach me all the stuff mm. that she knew, which mm. I knew that I did not. Mm. So um, they were very important to me, and I had lizards, and I, I had uh, I had seahorses at one point who had babies. Oh, you did? Really? Yeah, the males incubate the eggs in a little pouch, almost like a marsupium on a on a kangaroo, and the babies come shooting out of his belly, mm. and I was there when it happened. <laughs> and man, just talk about gobsmacked. You know, you know, this little kid and this male seahorse is like babies shooting out of his stomach. <laughs> oh, so cool. So, sure. you know, and um, as an adult, um, Christopher Hogwood, our 750 pound pig, um, taught me how to be with people at a time that I didn't, you know, I'm still pretty shy, but Chris. He, he was great with people. He could work a party. This pig. <laughs> we would have, um, we would call it dinner in a show. And in New England, you know, people don't like to throw anything out. And when you had a bagel with a little mold or you had some apples that were getting soft or some freezer burned ice cream, you didn't have to throw that away. You could bring it mm -hmm. to our house. And Christopher would love it. So you brought the dinner and the show was watching him eat it mm -hmm. and see his great appreciation. This is how I made half the friends that I have in town. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, animals have been so important. They've been everything, everything to me. Mm. All right, here's, here's another sexy question. And then we're going it's to turn be for to you structure. <laughs> uh, Ross. Um, <laughs> If you could become a flower, what type of flower would you become? Would you allow yourself to be pollinated by bees or plucked away for the affection of humans and playground songs or of children? What flower would you become? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, just to stay on track with what we're talking about. There is evidently a, an orchid, some kind of orchid. Is that right? It's an orchid, I think. And uh, it smells like a female orchid. No, like a female wasp. This is just ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but I'll say it anyway. For, um, you can pick another flower. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say another one. But, but, but this one, I have a poem about it. And this one, uh, the male wasp goes in there. It smells so much like the female wasp. But the, the, they copulate. The flower sort of copulates with the, with the wasp, you know. Um, yeah. So that's, that's one that would be, like, sort of uh, sexy. Um, but, you know, a flower that I die for is the night-blooming jasmine. That's a flower that, the, mm. oh, my God. The smell of that thing, it only blooms at night, and it's like creamy and like warm or something. It's just, oh my God, that flower, Jesus. Um, <laughs> that's a flower that I would love to, I wouldn't love to be that. I'd like to be my own self. Um, but I, I want another night-blooming jasmine plant, I guess. I covet it. Um, 
And there was a part of the question that was about like giving it away or something. Yeah. Um, would you? Here, we'll, um, I'll give it to you again. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, no, you can make of it as you will. Yeah. Would you allow yourself to be pollinated by bees? Oh, the pollinated by bees one was why I went dirty. Okay. Um, <laughs> Or, pl or plucked away by, for the affection of humans in playground songs or children. I mean, you know, yes, I'd allow myself to be plucked away for the affection of humans in playground songs of, of, of uh, children. Of course I'd allow myself to be plucked away, but I'd prefer just to stay in my living room, if I could. <laughs> Sigh. How do you decide how to organize the structure of your stories, hmm. alternating between anecdote and a meditation so seamlessly, and then any advice on pacing? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I, I often don't think this out very carefully. I don't work from an, from an outline. Um, that's a lovely, it's a lovely question. When I think that, um, that background Will, uh, will make the character stand out more of the animal. When I think that that background will enhance the reader's understanding of that animal's in integrity or value, or when I think it will um, deepen the understanding of the importance of the event that I'm describing or the scene that I'm pa painting, that's when I will deploy it. Science. But, Huh? Science, that's when you'll de deploy well, science? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it's kind of like your, your animals and what's happening to them is the gem and all the other stuff is the setting. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's kind of how I, how, I, how I use it because otherwise it, it makes you feel like you're learning a school lesson. But you know how when you fall in love with somebody, you want to know every single thing about them? Mm -hmm. um, I got to make sure the readers are really in love mm -hmm. if I'm going to give those facts, because then they'll be interested. But until they are in love, they may not, they may not care yet. And I'm using those just to deepen their, their respect for, their affection, their, their wonder, or whatever for the, the creature in the scene. So that's how I use the, when I deploy sure. this, the scientific facts and the historical background and that kind right. of stuff. And pacing, what about pacing? Do you have any advice? Well, when people start dropping off, that's when you stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you, you when you, when you talk to people about what you're working often, you see what makes their ears shoot up, you know, and then you, you, can, you can tell what really interests people. Um, however, my husband, who's the best editor I've ever had, I've got to say, he never really liked octopuses. He's never, he never wanted to meet any of them, and he still wonders what all the fuss of this book is about. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, I couldn't use his his interest as a gauge, but um, mm -hmm. a lot of other folks, I don't know, do you find that when you're, when you're writing, when you talk to people, do you, do you find that when you're, I mean, it's poetry, it's a whole other nation. Oh, not really. No, yeah. it's, I think it's, don't you think, uh, we're certainly uh, related. Well, mm -hmm. I'm so in awe of you guys. Mm. Well, that's very sweet. Um, and so we'll change the topic. <laughs> <laughs> to what? Um, okay, so I, th I think this question is, uh, is meant in one way, but I'm going to broaden it. Okay. And the question is, what is your favorite work, I think it's, it's meant, of yours, mm. and why? Mm. And the second question that goes with that is, do you feel that your work became more authentic once you were not under the influence of academic mentorship? Mm. But the other question I'd like to ask you is, what is your favorite work by others? Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's three questions yeah. in one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the question is, what's my favorite? Work of your own, I think. I think that's the initial yeah. question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. You know, I have, I have a handful of poems in this new book that I, I mean, I like, I like the poems in this new book. There's one poem in there called Spoon um, that 
um, I, it really sort of how it moves, I'm really glad about. It felt really lucky to have sort of caught it, you know. Um, I could not have written that poem two weeks before that, you know. It was just, it arrived. Um, I mean, ways, and you know, a ton of, ton of sort of work, but it, it, it interests me a lot still. It's still really mysterious and puzzling to me. Um, um, I don't know about an authentic voice. I don't, um, I try to steal, like if you read a lot of my like dearest friends who are also poets, Patrick Rosal, Adesely Skirmai, if you look at Steve Scafidi, if you look at their poems, you'd be like, oh, that's where Ross got that idea, you know. Um, and I'm not particularly interested in having an authentic voice. Um, 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 works of other peoples that I adore, I mean, that list is just on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Um, I was just reading Toni Morrison's newest book uh, this morning a little bit. Because she's someone who I just, you know, read like, have read like crazy and grew up reading, you know, I think sure. sort of formed my thinking about whatever, how sentences work, or even about sort of an ethical um, possibilities of, of literature, you know. Jamaica Kincaid is another author who matters a ton to me. Um, Gerald Stern, you know, my, my academic, my mentor. Um, and on, on, on and on, you know, it goes like forever. Have you talked with Jamaica about gardening? I mean, face no, to face, no? No. That would be interesting. Yeah. I mean, you both know so much, I yeah, think, about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be fun. Yeah. Um, what helps you remember the events of your books so vividly? How do you remember conversations? Mm. And oh, I take notes. I take notes. But with something like this, your hands are in the water. And they're frozen and they're wet. So that is really hard. So I would take my hands out of the water and run them under hot water and quickly write down everything immediately. Mm -hmm. And um, in, the, in the, oh, you know what? They didn't have an author photo. But there is a photo in that book in which I'm underwater with a dive slate, mm -hmm. taking notes mm -hmm. underwater mm -hmm. with an octopus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I write it down. And when I, when I travel for my other books, you know, I always have a, a little memo pad in my breast pocket. Mm -hmm. And that night, you know, when you're tired and you've got you know, ticks to remove, and you're just <laughs> exhausted, and you want nothing but to go to sleep. That's when I go over all of my notes, and I write usually an essay that night in my in my field journal. Um, the one book that this was all different for was Good Good Pig, because that was a memoir that I didn't know I was going to write until until the day Christopher woke up dead, and. I hadn't been taking notes, and I don't, I mean, my day-to-day -day life I thought was too boring for, to have a field journal. Um, but I took a lot of that, I actually went back and re-interviewed people who I knew. Right. Um, and one, one person who'd been tusked by Christopher Hogwood, or as the last medical report read, gored by pig. Um, <laughs> I actually went back and got those medical records. Um, so, so you're doing research on your own life. And the other thing was the boatman, who some of you saw today, I showed you a picture of Jarendra Nath Marita, who was my boatman in, um, in Schinderbin. I would write him uh, frequently long, detailed letters, which would then be translated by the village school teacher. And I kept copies of those letters. And I kept copies of all of his answers. And in that, a lot of the incidents that I describe in Good Good Pig were, were recorded in fresh detail. Is this the, is this the uh, boatman you had met uh, while you were writing the book on the, on the man-eaters? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. And you remained good friends. We did. And then one day, the letters just stopped. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he is probably still OK, but it is very possible that his village has been destroyed by a cyclone, because that happens a lot. And their houses are made of mud. They can make another. They can make another house, but um, we wrote each other devotedly for years and years and years. I kept every letter. He kept all of mine too, because I, I went. I went back and we did this National Geographic film years later, and I saw he had kept all of my letters, mm -hmm. and he had f framed all of the photos he had. Of Ross. Um, what is the thing you are most proud of? I think this 
Yes, I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> Who's proud of? Um, I'm so you know, proud is a word. I don't know about that word, but I'm really interested in this uh, this community orchard. I think it's a you know I'm just a, like a little participant, one of the <clears throat> you know hundreds or more people who have made it sort of this happen. I'm so interested. I'm so I think that's such a beautiful project. I don't know if I've ever been as happy to have been a part of a project as that. Yeah. So, I, um, are there any places you're looking forward to traveling to? Now, I think you're, you've written, finished a book on eels, and I think I overheard you say that you're going to be writing a book on sharks, the great well, white. Well, the great white shark. Yeah. I've got a book coming out June 7 in the Scientists in the Field series for young people, and for that, I got to to dive in a cage with great whites, which is fantastic. Mm. And you know, I'm not, as you know, if you, if, as you know from reading the the, the book, I am right. not a good diver. Um, and you add the often claustrophobic feeling of diving to being in a steel cage while a large predatory fish known for eating people is coming towards you. And you'd think that you would be nervous, but I wasn't at all. I felt mm. calm and relieved when the shark came toward me. I mean, this ocean for years was under the control of this apex predator, and now we've got control and we've screwed it up. Mm. So here he comes to rescue us. I was delighted to see him. But uh, <laughs> right before the launch of that book, I'll be returning from a trip to Masai Mara in Kenya, where I'm working on a book on the spotted hyena, oh my. which uh, great animal, very maligned. And then right after the launch of the shark book, I'll be going to the wildebeest rut. <laughs> in Tanzania with one of my best friends who is 88. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, okay, and I think we can um, uh, end. You didn't know that was your final question, but it was. Uh, and uh, your final question is similar, and that is what are you working on next? I'm working on a book about um, my relationship to the land. It's a nonfiction book. Uh -huh. um, and I'm working on uh, a long poem, maybe, on Dr. J, the basketball player. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> the fact is we could ask questions really all night. I have many more questions here, but um, I know that, um, that some of you need to go home. You've uh, come from a long way away. And we do have another feature of this evening, and that's a book signing. Um, books are still available out in the lobby. As far as I understand, we're going to set up a book signing table right up front. And I think you can, I think we're going to set it up over here. You can line up over on this side, and then come up the stairs and um, across, and go down those stairs. Don't jump off the front, okay? Mm. Uh, so thank you very, very much for being here. Yeah. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great, great joy. I'm so pleased. We're at Rollins College, and I speak, I, I, I know, for, for the whole college, um, and I think that, I hope for the community as well. We're so happy that you've, you're here, that, uh, that you're representing the National Book Awards, mm. that you're the writers, you're the writers you are. Mm. Um, and thank you, Harold, for, um, for making this possible. Yeah. Thanks very much.